Fabulous. Okay. Uh, hormone number two, let's talk about estrogens. Estrogens, that's a group of female sex hormones. There are many of them. This will not be on the test, but in a young woman in her reproductive years, estradiol predominates, but there are others, estrone, estriol, and others. Okay. So I was sitting here at this desk a number of years ago, and my phone rang, and it was a young woman who called up and said, she couldn't get out of bed and she needed my help. I said, what, what's the problem? She said, my mother told me to call you. Her, her mother turned out to be a physician in another part of the country who, whom I knew. And this young woman had menstrual pain. Many women have menstrual pain, but for maybe one in 10, it's off the scale. I cannot function today. And this young woman had a business meeting she needed to get to, but she couldn't, she couldn't get on the plane. She could really couldn't function. So she wanted me to give her some painkillers. And I said, yes, I can give you some painkillers for a couple of days, but what's going to stop this from happening again next month? And so I was, as she was describing what she was going through, I found myself trying to envision what could the problem be? Okay, let's walk through the, the possibilities. Uh, the most likely, or the first thing you're going to think about is what we call primary dysmenorrhea. If you look at the middle of your screen, that's the uterus. Off to the sides, you see the ovaries, and they're connected with the fallopian tubes. Okay, so that pink, skinny little layer in the middle, that's the endometrium, the endometrial layer. That's the, the inner lining of the uterus, and it's there to welcome a little developing embryo that might arrive. Um, so every month in anticipation of pregnancy, that end endometrial layer thickens up. But at the end of the month, it breaks up in menstrual flow. And when it breaks up, it releases prostaglandins that cause pain. So my hypothesis, my educated guess, if you will, was that this young woman had maybe too much estrogen in her blood. The estrogen was causing too much endometrial thickening. And that in turn, at the end of the month, what she was experiencing was this uh, breakdown of this larger endometrial layer leading to the production of prostaglandins and a whole lot of pain. Okay, that's one possibility, but there's another one, and that's endometriosis. Do you know this word, endometriosis? All caregivers on the call obviously do. Endometriosis is where the endometrial cells are not inside the uterus, or they, they may be there, but some of them are outside the uterus as well. And they look like these little raisins. They're on the outside of the uterus. They're stuck on the ovaries or the fallopian tubes, and they can even be on the intestinal tract. And that causes all kinds of symptoms that you don't want. So endometriosis is a thankless condition for some women. It causes terrible pain. It leads to infertility because of the damage to the ovary, the damage to the fallopian tube. It causes bowel problems because the cells attach to the bowel and disrupt its movements. No fun. Okay. So in both cases, estrogens drive the pathology. If I've got more estrogen in the blood, it's going to make that endometrial lining thicken up more. At least that's our mechanism. If it's endometriosis, estrogen causes the really the proliferation of those uh, extra uterine tissues. You don't want that. So as she's talking, I found myself remembering something. At Tufts University, researchers did some really amazing research on how to control estrogens. They brought in 48 premenopausal women, women during their reproductive years. They put them on a metabolic ward and they gave them isocaloric weight maintaining diets, meaning you're gonna make the diet so that nobody's weight really changes, but you give them a short diet that reduces the fat content. Or you give them a short-term diet, eight to 10 weeks, that increases the fiber content, one or the other, or maybe we do a diet that does both. We're gonna reduce the fat, increase the fiber. And what they discovered was that just reducing the fat in the diet causes estradiol and estrone, other estrogen fractions, to diminish. Only increasing fiber, okay, fiber, if you increase fiber, the estrogen fractions drop as well. So either you reduce fat or you increase fiber. In either case, estrogen levels fall. Now, these researchers were not thinking about menstrual pain. What they were thinking about is breast cancer. If I want to reduce the risk of breast cancer, how about if we reduce the estrogen driver of breast cancer? Okay, it makes sense. And it looks like foods 
can do that. Okay, so I suggested something to this young woman. She's had terrible menstrual pain. And I said, let me give you some painkillers for today, tomorrow, so, so that you can function again. But would you like to also try an experiment with me? Would you like to try a diet change? And she said, whatever it is, I'll try anything. I said, okay, for the next four weeks, how about this? No animal products. Vegan, it's going to be a vegan diet. Now, now, why would you do that? Because now there's no animal fat. I'm reducing fat. And everything you eat is a plant. So everything you eat has fiber in it. I'm reducing fat. I'm increasing fiber. Rule number two, minimize oil. Okay, got it. So now I'm really reducing the fat. I'm increasing the fiber content of her diet. My hope is that that will allow her estrogen levels to come down, less stimulation on the uterus or the endometrial cells next month. Maybe she'll feel better. Well, as it happened, four weeks later, my phone rang again. And it was the young woman. And she said, Dr. Barnard, I can't believe this. My period started today and I got nothing. I got no symptoms. I feel perfectly fine. And I said, well, let's, let's keep going with this. Great, great, great. So the next month, same thing. The next month, same thing. She's feeling fine. So what we discovered is this experience seemed to endorse the idea that estrogen levels can be modified based on fiber content and fat content of the diet. So that's one person. So we really need to do a larger study to see, is this real? Uh, will this affect other people? So with our colleagues at Georgetown University, we brought in 33 women. Half of them went on a diet, half of them went on a supplement. The diet was low-fat vegan. When I say vegan, I don't mean a person from the planet Vegas. I just mean a person who eats no animal products. Um, and the supplement that we used for comparison was really a placebo, a dummy pill, okay? After two months, the people switched. The diet group began the supplement, the supplement group began the diet. Okay. In a nutshell, it worked. Uh, we published the results in obstetrics and gynecology. And what we found was that pain intensity diminished, the duration of the pain diminished, and PMS symptoms got better as well. Bloating and water retention and moodiness, all of these things seemed to diminish. Now, I should say that there were different results for different people. For some, the effect was really small. For others, it was life-changing and huge, and their symptoms were just gone. Um, does this mean that some were following the diet better than others? Well, sure, but we really don't know um, in any given case how much the effect is going to be. But for every single woman who has had endometriosis and has had surgery for it, and like so many has had the problem just come right back and has had the doctor say, well, you're a woman, you have to put up with this kind of stuff. For every woman who said, enough of that, a diet change should always be something that we explore to see how it works. Okay, let me tell you about uh, a young woman named KL. She grew up in Louisiana. She was an Air Force aerospace engineer, and she went to Iraq in 2003. Now, while she was in Iraq, she was working pretty hard and she was eating what the government provided, which is not necessarily so much or very indulgent. Uh, but eventually her tour of duty came to an end and she was sent back to the US. And when she got off the plane, her family vowed to make up for all the foods that she was missing in Iraq. Okay, what did you miss? Oh, you know what I missed? I missed cheese mac and cheese, cheese snacks, all these things. Well, okay, fair enough. So uh, they made up for lost time. Lots of restaurants, lots of cheese. In fact, a friend of hers for her birthday gave her an entire case of 48 boxes of mac and cheese dinners, which she ate for 48 days straight. I'm not making this up. Well, what happened? She gained weight, but she also developed abdominal pain. It became more and more severe and turned out to be endometriosis. Okay. She sat down with her doctor. The doctor says, well, you know about the pain, but it's also going to lead to infertility. Fair enough. Let's give you pain medicines. Let's give you hormonal treatments. Let's see what we can do. It really was not doing the job. She just couldn't function, which, which is true for a great many women with endometriosis. And the doctor said, well, it's one other treatment we can give you. We can do a hysterectomy. Just take out your uterus. Let's just take it all out and the pain should be gone. Well, she was about 27. 
And she said to the doctor, my husband and I are kind of newlyweds. We were hoping to have a family. But the doctor told her that she was probably infertile anyway because of the extent of her endometriosis. And she probably had nothing to lose by having the hysterectomy. Okay. Well, she decided, all right, I'm infertile anyway. I can maybe just get rid of the pain with surgery. Let's do it. So they scheduled the, the hysterectomy for six weeks later. They couldn't do it sooner. And during that interval, she talked to somebody about her diet. She saw a nutrition coach who said, if I were you, I would get rid of the animal products. I keep the oils really low, the, the diet that we had pioneered for menstrual pain. She put it to work and she felt better. She felt a lot better. Uh, she was losing weight. Her energy was better, but her symptoms improved. But they weren't, they weren't really gone. There was still a little bit of that residual pain. And so she decided, well, if the hysterectomy makes all the pain go away, sign me up. That's what I'll do. So on the appointed day, she went to the hospital. And she was anesthetized. And about an hour later, she woke up. And she was in the recovery room. And the doctor was there. And the doctor said, I need to tell you something. I opened you up. I looked inside. And your endometriosis is essentially gone. I didn't take your uterus out. I, did, I didn't do the hysterectomy. You don't need that. The reason that you had some residual pain is that you had scarring and you had adhesions where the, where the endometriosis used to be. And so all I did was I just freed up those adhesions. And I think you're going to be fine now. Okay. Now, why did this occur? Well, the doctor said, I have no idea how this endometriosis went away. Well, her mother was in the recovery room with her. Her mother said, well, she went vegan, doctor. <laughs> the doctor said, stop it. Foods don't cause endometriosis. There is no way that a diet change is going to improve endometriosis. This must just be a miracle. Miracles happen all the time. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to praise the doctor for not taking out her uterus. But I think he was maybe uh, not aware that diet affects estrogen levels and estrogens drive endometriosis. Um, the work that was done at Tufts, that was done at other major medical centers, was apparently not well known. But a diet change makes estrogen change. And when, it, when estrogen levels diminish, endometriosis doesn't have so much drive anymore. Okay, so what happened? Well, she lost weight, she felt better, and for her and her husband, maybe best of all is she wasn't infertile. After all, they have three children now. So there you have, in fact, she's uh, decided to become an instructor to help other women to change their lives. <music>